Hello. At True North Sports and Entertainment, we care about the holidays, and thus we gave the entire staff the weekend off plus Monday because of Thanksgiving. And because of that, we pre-recorded this podcast that you're listening or about to watch, episode 165 of Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets with myself, Jamie Thomas, and other moving parts, which we'll get to in a moment. So because of that, we taped it early. And because we taped it early with Murphy's Law, a bunch of things happened after we taped it. So we're going to give you a big list of things and news and notes that have happened since we pre-recorded the podcast, starting with... Of course, defenseman Billy Hainala, who had a great opportunity to become one of the eight defensemen on the final roster for the Winnipeg Jets to kick off the 23-24 season. He fractured his ankle in the preseason finale against the Ottawa Senators out a minimum of eight weeks. Eventually, the Jets will be sending Billy home to be with family and friends to start his recovery. On Sunday, the Jets put Kyle Capabianco, Colin Delia, and of course, Axel Janssen Fialbi on waivers. All three of those players cleared waivers and are now with the Manitoba Moose of the American Hockey League, who, by the way, kick off their American Hockey League season Friday, October 13th here at Candle Life Center. And last but certainly not least, a special day for the Jets. On Monday, the news came out that Mark Shifley and Connor Hellebuck, two players that were entering their final year of their contracts and could have reached unrestricted free agency status, signed identical seven-year contract extensions with an AAV of $8.5 million. So those questions about their contracts, the distractions possibly coming with those, the contract situation are out the window. Connor Hellebuck, Mark Shifley uh, will be with this organization for the next eight years. And speaking with Mark Shifley yesterday, you can read this article on winnipegjets.com. Shifley said, I think it was really important, you know, to be a Jet for the next eight years. I think I'm going to be 39 when the deal is over. So to call myself a Jet for life, it's an honor, really. But not many guys get the opportunity to actually do that and be on one team their entire career. So that is Mark Shifley. Obviously, very happy with the news that he will be a Jet for what seems the rest of his National Hockey League career. And the same thing for Connor Hellebuck. And for Jets fans, everyone is thankful both cornerstones of this franchise around for the long term and the core will be together for an extended period of time. And now the franchise, the Jets, can move forward and prepare themselves for the season opener, which goes Wednesday in Calgary against the Calgary Flames. And, of course, the home opener will be Saturday, almost at Friday, but Saturday, October 14th, 3 o'clock start uh, here at Canada Life Center against the Florida Panthers. Now, enjoy the rest of the podcast, episode 165, featuring myself with Paul Edmonds, Mark Chipman and Daniel Fink. Hello and welcome to Ground Control, the Thanksgiving edition. We're thankful for you to tuning in. A uh, big guest list for you today. We've got Mark Chipman on the program on top of that Moose play-by-play -play voice, Daniel Fink. In the meantime, we begin things with the best of the group who just spent <laughs> five minutes That's a schmooze, if I ever, <laughs> five if minutes I ever mocking me before he comes on the show <laughs> he is paul edmonds the play-by-play -play -play voice of the winnipeg jets uh before we get into the season coming up for the jets the 23 24 campaign i i have a few questions for you and i, I want i want to ask you about this do you still get nervous before calling games oh yeah yeah, yeah. there's no question about it i I think that as you roll along in the season, those anxieties subside somewhat, but there's still butterflies, for lack of a better term, for every game. I always find at the start of the year more so than ever because you got to remind yourself that you know how to do this because <laughs> you've had several months of, of inactivity when it comes to, to calling a game. I yeah. mean, there's no... There's no secret sauce to kind of getting prepared for it other than doing it, right? You don't you can't work out in the gym. You can't get on the treadmill. Uh, you can't, you know, I guess you could kind of fake some some games and, and do some simulated stuff, but uh, nobody does that. So, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's some nervousness that always uh, kind of creeps in before games. And the other thing is you're, I think you're always proud of the product that you want to produce, and therefore you want to do it at a high level. And so there's an expectation, not only on the public, but you place on yourself. So sometimes I think that those get alleviated as you go through it and get a little bit further, but you want to make sure that you deliver the best product that you can. And if there's a big moment like Sidney Crosby's 1,000th point, you want to prepare for that and make sure that the call when he gets it uh, isn't fumbled. So there's nervousness with that as well. When we were in Washington last year, right before Christmas, Alex Ovechkin 
surpasses, moves into second place, moves past Gordy Howe for second all time in the all time goals list. How long was the pro- how long was that process for you for knowing what you were going to say in that moment? Should it have happened? Yeah, I probably all afternoon, mm-hmm. and then sometimes, you know, that's just a scenario where you can't just go off the cuff. You've got to make sure that you've written something down so that you can say it and deliver it concisely and and all really capturing the moment and making sure that if it's going to live in perpetuity that you want it to be as clear and concise as possible. So yeah, there's preparation. You're thinking about it leading up to it, but then in the afternoon when you're getting ready and doing your prep, you're spending a little bit of extra time making sure that you understand how these scenarios can kind of unfold. Almost, you know, like, you know, when an athlete kind of kind of gets into a, a little bit of that mode where they're thinking about scenarios in the game yeah. and, and doing that. Yeah, that happens sometimes with play-by-play. It doesn't always work out that way, but I'd rather be prepared that way mentally than not being prepared at all. What does it mean to you to call games for the Winnipeg Jets being a Manitoban? Uh, huge. I mean, yeah. I'm asked about this all the time. Mm-hmm. I grew up in West Winnipeg listening to some greats in Kurt Keelback and before him, uh, Kent Nicholson. And, um, you know, Kent Nicholson was uh, the guy that I listened to on a transistor radio when I was eight and nine years old in the WHA days. And yes, I'm dating myself, but that's all really I ever wanted to do. Now, TV has crept in and and really captured more of the audience than radio. I understand that. Yeah. Uh, But there's still a great audience on radio especially in our market and really traditionally across Canada so it serves a purpose for sure and it's very important to me and has been really all my career it's all I ever wanted to do and I had different stops along the way to try to get to here but this was always the end goal so I'm very very flattered that I got the opportunity very privileged and uh, certainly it's not that's anything that's lost on me anytime that I I do my preparation and, and go on the air to call a game are you superstitious Definitely. Yes. No question about it. Um, so when the Jets are in a win streak, and I've talked about this a million times, yeah. and I've seen you do it. Yeah, yeah. Do you change your routine if the Jets no. are in a win streak? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, and like – I'll have I'll go and have uh, the same lunch if I can. Um, if it was a subway lunch, I'll have the same sub, you know, or just do the same route to work yeah. um, to the rink on a home game. I usually do that anyway. Uh, but yeah, super superstitious. Uh, left sock always on first. Um, there's just things that I always do. I mean, I have as you've seen. There's certain ways that things get laid out. Yeah. Um, my scorebook and just some other things. Yeah. So and I think part of that is that comes naturally from being an athlete years ago yes and that comes hand in hand but then also spending so many years in baseball because that's the ultimate superstitious sport right Mm -hmm. and so being around that for that environment for two decades that rubbed off of me quite often and then you you see that and it gets taken into a jets or a, a hockey dressing room as well and and then by extension to the broadcasters so yeah i i'm superstitious no question about it so on top to continue with that at what point when you get in the booth do you not like to be bothered uh probably uh the the last half hour i'm okay with kind of being bothered yeah. it's the hour before that half hour because there's some final touches that you want to put on the broadcast or on your preparation and you just don't want to kind of have the interruptions you want to get it done and then feel like you can kind of take a breath mm-hmm. for that last half hour before you go on and think about some things that you want to discuss you know in in a preamble kind of to the the start of the game so yeah it would be an hour before the last half hour before you go on the air don't bother me and I asked you that question because when I first came here in 17 18 I tapped you on the shoulder hey have a good game Paul and you're like a big smile on your face and I came another time you're like locked in and I started to figure out after a while there was a little bit of a theme there and then sitting with you for three years I started to notice when people come and tap you on the shoulder you're locked in at certain points well you know it's understandably I mean it's if you get on there and stumble through this yeah it's on you it's It's on you yeah Right, especially the opener. See, the opener is always so important, and the opener is a, a pre-written read that I have, and you've mm. seen me write them, and I do them for every game. And you take a lot of time doing it too, because that sets the tone for the show. Mm-hmm. I've always felt if you have a clean read and a good script, and it goes off 
um, without a hitch, that's going to probably be the precedent for the way the night's going to go. Yeah, it sets the tone for your broadcast. It really does. Yeah. It's kind of like that first shift in hockey. Let's let's use that example or that metaphor. I mean, they always talk about getting a, a puck touch or a body contact to get into the game. And that's what you're really striving for in that first shift. It's the same with the opener. And and not only that, but as you know, bring your, your analyst in as well, yourself for three years, now Mitchell Clinton, mm -hmm. and then they kind of have an opportunity to chime in and they feel like they're into it as well and away you go for the rest of the broadcast. I always feel like if you kind of stumble your way and botch your way through the opening, then you're playing catch up for the rest of the broadcast and sometimes it's by the second period that you kind of forgot about it, but it does bother me, no question about it in the first period. You try not to after all these years, yeah. but you're, you're always striving for perfection. I understand that you're never going to achieve that, but if you can nail it off the start, it usually sets the broadcast off in a good direction. Before we move on the Jets, I just want to say three of the best years of my life uh, sitting in the broadcast booth with you. So it's kind of well. I had a great time yeah. with you. We had a lot of laughs. We had great interaction. We both loved the game, and and there was a lot of fun. And I think that's that's the root of what we're trying to to do here is not only deliver the broadcast and tell people what's going on, but have some fun and make it entertaining. I always tell people about this as well, that what we do, yes, it's hockey broadcasting, but it's entertainment in its purest form. Uh, the big reason why I brought you in here, it, it's, we were taping this the weekend before Thanksgiving. So bear with us on this. A lot of things have happened over training camp. There's been a lot of illnesses. There's been a lot of in injuries. I think we kind of saw that in that final game against Ottawa where it's kind of caught up to the Jets a little bit because they've been unable to ice the same team, the same group together. Do you agree with that? No question. I thought that in the Ottawa game, the first period was excellent and was representative of what we're going to see from the Winnipeg Jets and from the standpoint of the Ottawa Senators who haven't made the playoffs in six years. I mean, they've been building for that as well. It was a great, tight game, back and forth, real high energy. Energy. It was quick. It was fast. But as the game went along, Winnipeg slowed. And you saw that starting in the second period. And by the third period, they ran into penalty problems. And what happens in penalties? Well, it's because you're usually a step behind. Mm -hmm. And so you rattle off five or six straight minors in the third period and spend over half the period in the penalty box. It's a result of being a step behind. So, yes, the injuries and the flu bug, I think, had a... a a devastating effect on the last few days and maybe the last week of preparation for the Winnipeg Jets in the preseason. They could almost use an extra game now of preseason hockey just to get ready, but they don't have that. It's not at their privilege. So they'll use the rest of the time in practice to get ready for the 11th against Calgary and Alberta. How bad do you feel for Billy Hanela? Terrible. Mm -hmm. This this guy was poised to make this team. Now, it would be the second time that he made the team yeah. out of camp because he did his first year as an 18-year-old, and then they kept him for eight games, and then they then they shipped him back to the Moose, reassigned him there, and then he finished the season uh, with a couple of international events and then with his home country of Finland and then back in Finland. But this would have been a stick-and-stay opportunity for me, for Vili Hainala. He's really matured as a 22-year-old, and to go down with that lower body injury in the last preseason game when he's playing – you know, his fifth game of the six and in, in getting prepared for what is going to be, I think, a full-time job. Well, that's been stunted and delayed now and I feel awful for the kid. I guess the best thing that happens in this scenario for him is he's 22, so there's time to recover and time to get back and, and kind of chase that again. So um, the injuries are part of the game and they usually happen on the blue line a lot more than anywhere else, certainly on your roster. So it's always why teams carry more defensemen, but I feel bad for Billy Hanley because I think that this was the year that he was going to seize not only a roster spot full time, but maybe a spot in the starting six. Well, the season does start this week. Uh, I'll get your bold prediction before we go to the ground control mailbag. So I'm putting you well, on the spot. Oh, there's a mailbag. <laughs> yeah, there okay. is. You didn't warn me about that. <laughs> well, you didn't have to write into it. I'm just putting you on the spot. About <laughs> Do you want yeah, to write into the mailbag? Who's, who's writing into this? <laughs> well, I have your you wife, here, so I don't my have wife, yes. your kids, my mom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my oh, we got one from Cochrane, Alberta. Adam over there, Pam. <laughs> Daniel, all right. Into the mailbag. So, you're, are you trying to stall here? So, no, what, not at all. What's your What's your bold prediction for the Winnipeg Jets in twenty three twenty four? I believe they'll make the playoffs. Okay, I believe that they're going to be a hard working, a little more blue collar team with some high skill, mm -hmm. and I think that that's what our market kind of is excited about. Yeah, I I believe that after you get past the two heavyweights in Colorado and Dallas, that it's really open for anybody to grab that third spot and then what's going to happen with all the other teams and maybe a wild card through that, that central division. 
but I believe the Winnipeg Jets have the opportunity to finish as high as third. Yeah. Uh, maybe, I mean, the sky's the limit, really. We yes. don't know. But I, I think in doing a bold prediction and something that I think would be fair and accurate, I think that there's an opportunity for them to supersede Minnesota in that third spot. I don't think Minnesota got any better. I think the Winnipeg Jets changed their lineup. They still have a 42 goal scorer and a Vesna Trophy goaltender. Uh, that's a pretty good start and some, then some new guys pushing into the lineup. So I think that Winnipeg will be destined for a playoff spot and maybe as high as third in their division. And then if not, then they're going to fight for a wild card spot yeah. because once you get past the top four, and I include Winnipeg in there and Minnesota as well as the two heavyweights I talked about, I don't know what St. Louis is going to do. They're sort of in a rebuilding mode. I don't know how Ryan O'Reilly is going to react and, and really take Nashville to the promised land. We know about Arizona. We know that Chicago is trending to be better, but once you get past that first line with Connor Bedard, Taylor Radish, and Taylor Hall, I mean, there's not a whole lot left that's there when they're building. So there's a lot of question marks around the teams below, and I think that's where they're going to be. So this is an opportunity for Winnipeg. When it used to be a real tough division, I believe that it's not necessarily that way through and through now. So it's an opportunity for the Jets, I think, to seize a a playoff spot once again for the second straight year, either as a divisional team and one of the three, or certainly as a wild card team. All right. So if you want to write in with your bold prediction or question of the week, everyone, you go to ground control at winnipegjets.com. Write that down. <laughs> I got a mental note. <laughs> okay. Andy Hall's bold prediction is the Jets uh, will make it to the cup final. You'll appreciate these next ones coming from bold predictions. Hero Brandon says, Shife with more assist and goals. And my favorite, Buff watches a game at Canada Life Center. This season, bold prediction. That would be great. Uh, another guy says, Jamie Thomas gets new skates. That's <laughs> nothing to do with the Winnipeg <laughs> Jets. Uh, Winter Dan says, winning the season series against Dallas and clinching the division after we beat them on April 11th. Uh, Cordy Bras says, top line combines for 260 points. Uh, Mishka SB says, Ehlers plays 82 regular season games. And last but not least, um, Le Burger Peg says, the Jets win the Central. So those are the bold predictions, courtesy of our friends at Reddit um, and Winnipeg or Ground Control at WinnipegJets.com. So every week we'll have a question of the day for you to respond to. Paul Edmonds, appreciate your time as always. Thank you for three wonderful years in the booth, and good luck to you this season. My pleasure, buddy. Anytime. Yeah. Good luck with this uh, new platform. Thank I think you. you'll 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 hit it out of the park. I appreciate that. One of our favorite parts here on Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, is the play of the day, and it's brought to you by Connor Hellebuck in the Jets' preseason finale against the Ottawa Senators. The Chuck, block pass, Drew gave it back. Good feed, Kugelik, nice stop there by Hellebuck, his best of the game by far. I thought I was going to be a little later. I like, you know, I thought I was kind of going to be like around 11, 12, or 13. And I knew I knew Winnipeg was interested, but I also was like, oh, it's seven, it's way too ahead of, it's way too far ahead of me. But then. You know, I kind of got this like wave of like emotion when they walked by and I guess Chevy actually blinked at my agent and I had gum in my mouth. My agent was like, spill your gum. I think you're going. And I was kind of like, what? Like I just had no, I just had no, had no idea. And then, you know, all of a sudden I heard Barry Colts and I was like, that it's actually happening. And like everything just went black. It was almost like just like a wave of anxiety, relief, stress, like all, all every, every single emotion that can pass through your brain went through my brain and, um, you know, then obviously, obviously the rest is history. That is another episode of Homecoming, the return of the Winnipeg Jets, the podcast, uh, courtesy of Sarah Lesky, uh, episode two available right now on winnipegjets.com. In the meantime, my next guest is uh, my boss and pretty much everybody's boss inside here at True North Sports and Entertainment. He is Mark Chipman. Do you like the nickname or the title executive chairman? Um. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't give it a lot of thought. It just is kind of is what it is. Do you ever introduce yourself as the executive chairman of the Winnipeg Jets? I don't think I've ever done that. No, no. <laughs> you sat down with Sarah for an extensive, you know, interview about the return of this hockey club. Do you enjoy going back over everything that happened leading up to that? You know what? I, I kind of did because it was the first time mm -hmm. that, um, that I've ever done that. And, and, uh, and then hearing it, um, or the first uh, first couple episodes of it, um, was um, was kind of emotional to be honest. It you know everything leading up to uh, bringing the team back happened over a long period of time, and then and then everything got very fast. And then once we got in the league, it's been 
kind of a blur, you know, and, and so it was, it was really, um, I guess I was, I was grateful to be able to go through it with Sarah and, and, uh, it prompted a lot of memories that, of things that I kind of put in, you know, put away and, and, uh, so it was, it was neat. It was a, it was a, it was a good experience going back through the whole thing. After the initial, when, when the initial press conference was done, did you go home and sit back and take it all in for a bit? Did you allow yourself that moment? Cause there's a lot of work that you just talked about the, long, the amount of time that went into it. You know, um, actually no. I mean, I remember, um, it might not have been the first day after, but it was shortly after and we, you know, we weren't even settled in offices at the time or we were moving a lot of people around. And for some, for some reason, I ended up in the same office as Claude Noel for a stretch. And he had, uh, so this would have been a while after the announcement, but we were sharing an office in the basement of the arena. I can't tell you why. And he had a long list of stuff to do. And I had a long list of stuff that I was working on. And, and I remember that we were both kind of, we stopped and we were kind of, got a bit of a laugh out of the fact that you know we you know had this just a, a long list of things to to get done and I, I don't remember there being any real pause after the league came in to be a part of the announcement it just like we got shot out of a gun and we had to because we even though we had a good organization in place in many respects there were a lot there were a lot of people to bring on board and uh a just a lot to get organized in a short period of time. Well, the NHL draft came quickly after that, and you were just sharing a story of, you know, Mark Shifley's the first pick, and you had to leave right afterwards. I did. It was my daughter's uh, high school graduation that day, and I was able to get to the airport uh, in time to get home and uh, get, you know, there for most of the evening. So it was something I you know, obviously wasn't going to miss. But I, I, it was, again, it was just how everything went. It was yeah. everything was just like on the fly, and uh, I was, you know, obviously I w- wasn't going to miss the draft, and and um, and that turned out to be a real important day in our history. So I was glad to be able to be there for that. But I I did, I only caught the first round. I didn't even get a chance to meet Mark actually. Um, he you know he got he as 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 it happens at at the draft he got sort of uh, whisked away mm-hmm. to a media crush, and I just uh, grabbed my stuff and headed to the airport. Did you have any idea that your third round pick that year was one day going to be your captain? Uh, honestly, true story. I, I remember one of our amateur scouts making that comment at, at uh, not long. I, obviously, I was gone, but mm-hmm. but uh, that year uh, or shortly uh, thereafter, I remember somebody saying this guy could be the captain of the team someday. I remember Mark Lamb, of course, who was the coach of the Swift Current Broncos and general manager, named him. He said the second he met Adam Lowry, he knew he had leadership written all over him. And I guess you just echoed that kind of statement. Yeah, he, he for me, you know, there's lots of different styles of leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the one I, I, I think I'm most fond of is, you know, would fall under the category of servant leadership where he, you know, um, just is entirely selfless and, and always puts uh, the well-being of his teammates ahead of himself and and uh he does a lot of other things really well uh in terms of his leadership skills but uh, that's what stands out for me speaking of the draft how much do you enjoy sitting at the table and with all the all the stuff that's going on during draft weekend or draft week for that matter well it's always a really exciting time i look forward to it i i've you know i've gotten to know our amateur scouting team well over the years and i i just hold them in you know in such high regard it's it's not just the draft or you know the day of um it's the 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 days leading up to it and you know the conversations and 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 watching and observing the thought processes that i really uh always look forward to the 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 draft itself is always really exciting and we've had some exciting drafts you know where 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 players have fallen in you know that we didn't into places where we were able to select them that we didn't expect and so there's there's usually a little bit of drama um and uh in 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 excitement so yeah it, it's it's and it's also it's it's like um you're pushing the button if, you know again for a new start and and a new crop of kids and and i think everybody's really excited about you know uh, the players that we, we've drafted in the past few years that are starting to starting to mature now i, I want to go back to you mentioned you go into your daughter's graduation you have three daughters you're owner of the Winnipeg Jets. Do your daughters ever come to you with ideas of how you should do things? No. <laughs> um, I mean, they're all very passionate about yeah. the game. They all played the game. Um, 
my middle daughter Annie has worked for us mm-hmm. you know for um, uh, she's back in school right now but will come back to work for us and uh, you know she played the game um, uh, at the US college level and she's uh, you know passionate about the game and and the business and so I mean it's nice to be able to uh, to share that with them and uh, but all three of them are you know very very passionate about the city and what the team means to the city and so uh, the, I find that to be a really good thing, you know. And my wife is very, very much the same way. It's a, they they end up being a, a real, um, you know, uh, they're they're a shoulder and, mm-hmm. and a support group that that uh, I don't take for granted at all. Well, it's a perfect segue to my next question. What is the emotional commitment of owning a professional hockey team? Yeah, I don't know how to I don't know how to sum that up. I mean, it it um, I think the biggest challenge that comes with it is um trying to keep some you know keep the balance of life in perspective because it can be very consuming um especially in a market our size and uh and knowing the history you know being a part of the history as we were and trying to keep the team here in the first place and understanding how how important the team is to our community it 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 uh it brings with it you know whether uh, I bring this on myself or not, but it, it, it feels like there's a, just an enormous amount of responsibility that comes with it that is hard to manage sometimes, you know, because you're, you just, it's not just my expectations and that, that you're, it, it's the expectations of the community that you're always trying to meet and you know, they're high. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, if, if things don't go the way you hope and expect, it's, it's, it can weigh on you because you, you, you just don't want to let people down. And so I, it's, I don't mean to suggest it's, it's a, it's a burden, you know, that, uh, it, but it's, it's, uh, it's can be very consuming for sure. Well, when a season comes to an end, how long does it take you to park it and be able to move on to, okay, here's, there's another season coming up. Uh, it depends on how it ends. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, cause every season's different. Yeah. I mean, it depends on how it ends. It can take, um, it can take a, a few days. It can take a few weeks, yeah. and uh, and you never get used to it. Um, you just don't. And it's uh, there's a real, um, you know, there there. It's a hard feeling to describe when it's over, and and you come into the rink, and the power has been turned off on the ice, and you know, and the season's over. And it, it, because there's so much effort from so many people that go that goes into creating and playing a hockey season, and and then it's it's over. So, as I said, it depends on how it ends. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm, 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 I've been doing this is, I guess, year 28. I'm starting. I still haven't got at. I still have not perfected, or got even got close to, to um, uh, getting good at losing. So, um, you know, it it takes time for sure. Yeah. Um, so lots of renovations. There's lots of changes in the building. It looks great. Yeah. So how uh, is it easy to come in here and see everything where it's almost finished and you can enjoy that at least before the season starts? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the, the way this has all turned out. And, you know, this has been the culmination of many seasons of, of upgrading this building. And I think we've said on record, I think we're, by, by the time uh, this work is done, we're going to be close to, in terms of capital investment, uh, we're going to be full of spent since we joined the NHL just about as much as we did building the place mm-hmm. and and that but that needed to be done we had an adequate building and um, but it wasn't uh, you know to the standard it needed to be and we think it is now and much of it has reflected the you know a lot of it's reflected the input from our from our fans and and um, you know we started up in the 300 level it needed first it, it really needed improving and and then we've kind of worked our way down and and now I feel like you know we can put this up this building up against pretty much any of them in the league. I'd like to close this interview out with kind of like a positive thought. So the, the big trade comes in Nashville, the announcement anyways. So Pierre-Luc Dubois goes to Los Angeles. Alex I follow Gabriel Velarde, Rasmus Kapari, and a second round draft pick come back. When you, that piece and you're hearing the return coming back the other way, what is your reaction? Well, I mean, that was a, it's not like that happens all of a sudden. Right. You know, like, like uh, trades in this league can take, uh, an eternity mm-hmm. and uh and and that one was navigated by by kevin and and larry and 
and Zinger, you know, very methodically, as I assume it was on the other end of it. So it wasn't like it was all of a sudden, you know, this is what we're getting. Uh, you know, it, we were all together and we were in Nashville as it as it played out. And I think the feeling was, um, it was it was it was positive. It was very positive. We knew we were getting uh, three proven NHL players coming back and a second that we don't, didn't have uh, next year. And, you know, you want to have your seconds. And so that was great. Gave up a very good player in, in, yeah. in PLD and a good kid. So, you know, it's always bittersweet because you get to know these guys and they're good people and, you know, you wish them the best. But, you know, and it, I, I, I have a habit of calling the players when, when we make a trade and and uh, you just you don't know what's going to be on the other end of the line. First of all, the guy doesn't know me from the back of a bus. And um, but I was really encouraged when I when I got a chance to speak to those kids and say, you know, hey, um, uh, welcome to the Winnipeg Jets, and we're really excited. And there was a there was a real genuine uh, excitement in their voices, and and that was very evident when I got to meet them when they got to town. And so far, they seem to have fit in very well. So um, yeah, I think again, you know, Chevy and his group did a a really fine job of navigating that. It was a difficult situation and uh, as and complex as these yeah. always are. They're never as easy as, you know, they're made out to be or people think they are. They're complex and, and they take time and patience and, and that's what Kevin's really good at. Absolutely. One of the best at that. Uh, it's very exciting. Season openers on Wednesday, the home openers on Saturday against the Florida Panthers. Mark, th thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, Jamie. The Manitoba Moose home opener is October 13th against the Calgary Wranglers, so we'll bring in Moose play-by-play -play voice Daniel Fink. That's up next. What are you doing on October 14th? <laughs> well, the home opener against the Florida Panthers is on October 14th. Be sure to visit the party in the plaza in True North Square to start your pregame party at noon. Plus, every fan in attendance at the home opener will receive a Winnipeg Jets and Canada Life toque. That's one toque with two things on it. Go to winnipegjets.com slash tickets for tickets now. It to him now, Evangelista sends it for Gross. He misses him with the pass, and Jeff Malott is in on a breakaway. Coming off the wing, Malott shoots, turned aside, Chisholm scores! Declan Chisholm, overtime winner! And the Moose take this one, four to three! All right, Canada Life Center will be extremely busy this weekend. Three games in three nights. The Moose playing on Friday and Sunday. The Winnipeg Jets home opener on Saturday afternoon. But in the meantime, let's talk about the Manitoba Moose. He is the voice of the Moose. He is Daniel Fink. And uh, first question for last year, you got to go and call a game in your hometown. We're going to get to the Moose here in a second. What was the significance of that to you, calling the game in Calgary, the Saddle Dome, one of the most treacherous walks to the press box in the history of ever? <laughs> but what did that mean to He's you? He's just pulling out the big guns <laughs> yeah, right away. Yeah, yeah, get right into well, it. Here I come. Yeah. Okay, Jamie, yeah. let's talk about the Moose. No, we're going to talk about your emotions Let's get first. to your emotions first, yes. Um, yeah. That was one of the best nights of my life. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Saddle Dome is where I saw my first pro hockey game. I got into hockey really, really late. I lived overseas. I didn't before we left. I didn't really skate a lot or anything like that. But my, when when I was um, well, my aunt got me NHL ninety nine for my birthday. I was living in Saudi Arabia at the time. No, no, no hockey rinks there, right? So that's how I got into and learned about hockey. And then I would watch playoffs. I would always catch the double triple overtime games during the playoffs because that's when I woke up and the games yeah. were still going so I realized there's a whole roundabout way of getting there but eventually moved back home to Calgary dad takes us to see the Flames and the LA Kings I think it was the last game of the season um, and, and we got a deal on tickets or something like that so we went and I think Ziggy Palfy scored the game winning goal for the Kings um, so that's that's one of my earliest hockey memories. Now I'm older at the time, so easier to recall. But yeah. um, and then I went on to uh, intern for the Calgary Hitmen, and uh, that walk you were talking about, Brad Curl, who's been the voice of the Hitmen for a long time, looks at me and says, "Are you afraid of heights?" I said, "I am terrified of heights." He says, "Well, good luck," <laughs> and starts across this catwalk. Um, that I had to kind of get used to doing. And you know how the, that press box just kind of shakes a little bit, yes. especially if it gets loud in there. I remember being in there when the Hitmen won the WHL championship and the building's just vibrating because it was absolutely packed. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so, and then got to come back with the Regina Pats when I worked there. That was always very cool. I always had a bunch of friends sitting down up near the glass uh, and, and they they have signs and things like that, which is really, really weird. And I 
don't think anybody had any idea who they were cheering for. Um, but that, that was cool. But obviously, it wasn't calling the game then. I was just doing color commentary with, uh, with my good friend Phil Andrews. And so to, to finally get to come back and to sit down in that seat, uh, I th- honestly, in the booth or a booth over from where when I was interning with the Hitmen, I would go and practice play by play to actually call the game and a win which was rare enough when we were with the Pats. We always seem to lose there. Um, it's a call a win in that first game. It was it was quite the feeling. It was really cool. And, uh, yeah, I mean, to, to be in that building, and to, they're talking about getting a new building there. That, that saddle, though, might be very utilitarian. A lot of people might not like yeah. it, but it's one of the most beautiful buildings on the planet to me, and to call that game there was really cool, which yeah. was a very, very long answer. But. Yeah. No, no, but that's what, that's what we're getting to. And, and the reason why I ask you to get into that, because it was a call against the Calgary Wranglers. The Wranglers will be here for the home opener. Home openers are always very unique every year, and one thing I've always appreciated about the Moose is the, the show, the extra stuff that goes on during the games itself. What's in store for that home opener for the fans in the game against Calgary on Friday? Well, I am excited about the giveaway that they're doing. They're mm-hmm. giving away flags. And it's not just like, like you, you'll see, it's not like a car flag. Mm-hmm. It's not like a little little flag. Like the, It's a full, it's a flag. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, I'm excited to see people wearing them like capes and shaking around mm-hmm. and, and waving them. And then yeah, they'll be up on kids' walls for years to come, things like that. So that's that's a really cool giveaway. Um, but uh, you know what? It's, it's, it's really amazing. Um, some behind the scenes here. When the when teams do their media days and their production days, things like that, NHL tends to be right at the beginning of camp. So you have about close to a month mm-hmm. before that. The AHL, it can be about a week or less. Um, so Colin Peterson and his crew do an incredible job of turning around all of these shots and turning them into all of the things you see up on the video board or down on the ice with the projection and then some stuff they're able to work on ahead of time. Uh, but there's stuff that they'll be getting on Tuesday and turning around for Friday, and it is a big effort for them. And to see that all pay off, I, I'm, I'm in the great spot, right? I just get to see it all happen, mm-hmm. kind of like everybody else. I just get to see it all happen and don't have to deal with some of the stress behind the scenes. But uh, to see their efforts pay off and to hear the crowd react to all of that and hear the crowd react to the guys coming home, it's great. And then the puck drops, and then it's just a new season. It's hockey all over again. Yeah, the way the season came to a crash last year, like just how, like how, how heartbreaking was that for the guys? The way things happened against Milwaukee in the opening yeah, round last it, year. What a what a roller coaster, right? Because that because after the year before and then five games. Well, yeah, and, and I mean and, it was yeah. it was kind of a role reversal, right? Yeah. The Moose were the favored team last season. Mm-hmm. Devin Cooley comes in, steals two games in Milwaukee, and all of a sudden the Moose are up against the wall, and they just really they only got outplayed one period. Unfortunately, it came in game five and it put them behind the eight ball. This season around, it was definitely the Milwaukee Admirals or the favorite team. They had 10 guys playing in the NHL the last month of the season. All of a sudden, they're all back in the AHL. Because Nashville didn't make it. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's a tough thing to overcome. Well, the Moose have a tough start uh, in Game 1. They get that uh, absolutely wild finish in Game 2 where Cole Meyer ties it late and then Jansen Harkins wins it early in overtime. Uh, and then off to Milwaukee, Wyatt Bongiovanni wins it in overtime for the Moose. They're up in the series now, uh, but you knew that veteran Milwaukee team just wasn't going to go away, and, and they came in with a real strong game uh, the next night uh, to force that game five. And uh, what a game that was. It was mm-hmm. tight. You could tell the Moose were a little up against it. The Milwaukee had kind of closed things down, and then Jansen Harkins again comes in with his fourth goal of the series to tie it with two minutes to go. And then the Moose give up that goal with about 20 seconds left with the most improbable. It's amazing how this sport gives you something. Just when you think, like, I mean. Momentum's in your I've favor. Seen, I've seen, well, I've seen a lot of things yeah. happen in hockey. I maybe haven't seen everything. But two players colliding at just the worst possible moment. The puck pops right out into the middle of the ice when usually it should skip up the wall. Another player turns, runs into another one of the Moose players, and all of a sudden it's a two-on-one where it probably should have been a two-on-two. And then it's in the back of the net, mm-hmm. and there's 20 seconds left. So it's it's one of those crazy finishes that uh, it, you're always going to remember it. Uh, you you wish that you remembered sometimes some of those more positive things. Of course, going to remember those OT winners for the Moose, but a very heartbreaking way for that series to go. But you know what? For the players, 
that really does instill that drive. Mm-hmm. And even we've already heard guys talking about, I think Wyabon Giovanni was talking today. We've, we've been to round one a couple of times. We know we can get to round two. We want to cross over that. So there's that drive instilled in the players. Okay. So when new season is upon us, last year, Brad Lambert and Chaz Lush, just the Winnipeg Jets, a couple of Winnipeg Jets first round picks began the season with the Moose. Here they are again expectations must be a little bit higher for those two this year right yeah i mean it's 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 interesting right so you had those guys and, and the expectation was we don't know where these guys are going to play mm-hmm. i mean they're, they're here with the moose right now they could be in junior next week as it turned out it was after world juniors and uh, then they went uh, went to their junior clubs uh where of course brad lambert featured very well Chaz lucius unfortunately got injured but was lighting the whl on fire for yes, those six was. games uh and, and now now they're here they're with the moose and i think there's some stability for those guys too they i think they have a little more knowledge of what's going on in their situation, and uh, that should help. They have that, uh, they have that comfort with the team and the coaching staff. And I think, as we saw, kind of getting to the later stages of their time with the Moose, they were kind of settling in and, and kind of finding their space within the team and, and finding themselves off the ice and on it. Um, so now it'll be interesting to see what lessons they were able to learn in junior, kind of playing against. Uh, players of their age group uh, playing against their peers rather than maybe playing a little bit out of their depth in their age range. Uh, now they get that chance to, to to take another run at it and it'll be very interesting to see how they progress this year and quite frankly on a very young Moose team, exciting. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, define what the Moose will be this year. Young. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, you just said I, it right I think there. You've, you've got a lot of returning players, and you've, you've got your Jeff Mallott, you've got your Dominic Tony Nato, you got uh, guys like Jimmy Olney who have been there, and Ashton Sautner, and um, the list goes on. So there is that support for those young players. And uh, as it stands right now, I mean, you, the roster will shake out how it's going to shake out, but uh, there will still be more players to come back to the Moose from the Winnipeg Jets. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how the young guys progress throughout the season, uh, but they do have that support, and that can be so important in the American hockey league I and mean, sometimes you see these summer signings and fans will kind of scoff well why are we bringing that guy in or uh, oh who's that guy well that guy has played 300 professional games has been around the block knows what's going on maybe he doesn't play in the nhl every night uh he has that ability to log minutes in the nhl but his place is in the ahl and he can be a mentor for those young players and those players are very important for your young guys to learn from Jansen Harkins has moved on to another organization. Uh, it was strange to not have him around here. Where does the offense come from? That's in his a really absence? good question, isn't it? I yeah. mean, the Moose uh, heading into the season, I mean, could be without six of their eight top scorers yeah. from last season. When you think about Declan Chisholm and and Billy Hainla, where they end up, uh, whether it's in the NHL or in the AHL, of course, a few players move on in the off season. So, I mean, you look at a guy like Jeff Mallott, who is perennially scoring twenty goals now in the American Hockey League. He's going to be leaned on to to be a consistent scorer. Dominic Toninato was having a very good season for the Moose uh, last season, so you're looking at him to provide that offense up front. So. Uh, those young guys, there's so much skill there. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at your Chaz Lucius, Brad Lambert, Nikita Chibrikov up front, Danny Jilkin. Uh, those guys have that skill. They have that talent. It can take a little bit to, to find your way and, and apply it at that next level to find that space uh, where you maybe had a little more in junior or, or where you were previously it's not necessarily there in the American Hockey League. So you've got to find and adjust, and those tweaks are what send guys up to the next level. So it'll be interesting. There's a lot of expectation for those players. Can they fill those scoring roles as young players in the American Hockey League? It's a great challenge for them and a great opportunity to develop. Yeah, those questions and more will start to be answered on October 13th. The Calgary Wranglers in town here at Canada Life Centre. Daniel, thanks for your time. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks again for tuning in to the Thanksgiving edition of Ground Control. Appreciate your emails, your insight, and everything, and especially tuning in to the broadcast. A reminder, email me your thoughts on groundcontrol at winnipegjets.com. Of course, go through our Reddit avenue as well. Next week's guests include Pete Jensen, fantasy hockey guru from NHL.com, and the big fish, Elliot Friedman, Sportsnet Hockey Insider. That's all coming up next week on Ground Control. We'll see you then.